Good morning. I'm glad you were able to take a moment to uh, join in this uh, time of worship. There are no announcements uh, today. We continue to worship at 10 a.m. in the sanctuary in Shelbina. Please wear a mask and, and we'll have fans going on, uh, moving air through the building to keep everyone safe. And uh, Honeywell continues to worship outside at 8, 8 a.m. for anyone who'd like to join over there. Uh, bring your uh, your lawn chair and come on over. The reading this day is Matthew 18. We're continuing to look at the Lord's Prayer. We're looking at the, the part about uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And this we're going to use a parable that Jesus uh, teaches around the nature of forgiveness. Matthew 18, 21 to the end of the chapter. Then Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, seventy-seven times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him ten thousand talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all of his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. Out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. Seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you and all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In 1992, there were riots in Los Angeles, and a fellow named Ren Re Reginald Denny was pulled from his truck and beaten by four men. After a long recovery, he had, to, he had there was some speech damage. He had, it caused some brain damage. Uh, he had to relearn how to walk. He, he was rather hurt by this moment, this attack. After a long recovery, he was able to meet with the people who had hurt him. At that meeting, he shook, shook hands with them and forgave them. The reporter who was there watching this happen offered the following commentary. He said, it is, it is said that Mr. Denny is suffering brain damage. To the reporter, the only way to explain what he was watching was that Mr. Denny was not thinking clearly. For who would forgive being hurt in such a manner? Yet this is part of the prayer that we join in weekly, if not more often. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. Forgive as in let go. Let go of what we are owed. You hurt me, and so now I have every right to hurt you back. But I let go of that, and I will not. And this is what Mr. Denny did. He did not hurt those men back. He could have sought their pain and their suffering. He could have sought retribution, and instead he chose to forgive. Now, some translations of this, this part of the prayer say debt, other says trespasses. Either one has a very serious connotation, either debt as in owing someone, have, or trespass as in having crossed a line that should not have been crossed. Either one gets at the seriousness of the sin that's being considered. The people who had hurt Mr. Denny, they had crossed a line and they owed him a debt and he forgave them. Thinking about this, thinking about debts, it begin, it, it's a question for us to ponder. What would it look like for us to follow Mr. Denny's lead? To be a community that forgave debts, forget, forgave debts of many types. 
What would, be, what would it look like to be a community, to be a people that acknowledged that we are each in debt? To not pretend that we all are, are debt free, but to acknowledge that we are in debt to each other because of the assumptions we have made about what we can and cannot do. We are in debt to each other because of what we have taken for granted and thus hurt people. We are in debt to God with debts that are too significant, debts that we cannot pay that we can only ask forgiveness for. What would it look like to acknowledge that this is the community that we live in? We live in a community of debt, and we need to be able to learn how to let go and forgive debts. 1 John 1.8 reminds us that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We all have sin. We all have debts. And to acknowledge that is to tell the truth. So to pray this often, forgive us our sins, forgive us our debts, forgive us our trespasses. That's not how we want to think about who we are. We don't want to think of ourselves as debtors, as people who are in debt. We would prefer to say something like, teach us to, to forgive so that we might forgive others. Because we would, it would be so much more satisfying to see ourselves as people of magnum, magnanimity, of uh, people of forgiveness, people of grace. We are the sources of the good things, right? You got, you've hurt me, but I, I'm being so magnanimous that I will forgive you, right? No, that's not really where it is. It's not teach us to forgive so that we're so good we can forgive others. It is, forgive us our debts, because we have them. And then we will be, as we have forgiven our debts. So how do we understand this to work? Forgive as we forgive. Is it a mechanical thing? Is it like an algebraic uh, formula? If we're going to start talking about forgiveness and talk about debts and, and the debts we have towards each other and towards God, if we approach it with this sort of algebraic thing, algebraic understanding, like I owe so much and I have so much debt that needs to be forgiven and how much debt do I have and how much did look at ourselves as some sort of like a bank balance sheet of debts, like it leads to some very odd places where we start thinking like, you know, if I'm only a little bit of a jerk, and I only need a little bit of forgiveness, like forgive, forgive my debts as I forgive those uh, who owe me debts, right? So if, if I'm only a little bit of a jerk, do I only have to forgive that much of other people so that I can be forgiven of how much I've been a jerk? And so if I'm only a little jerk and a lot of people have been a jerk to me, I'll forgive that person, but the rest of you all can just buzz off. I'm not going to forgive you, right? It, that, is that how it is? Or if I've been a really big jerk and, and people have have not been that much of a jerk to me do I have to like wait till the amount of forgiveness I have to offer others adds up to the amount of forgiveness that I need like how do we weigh the relative values the, the absolute values of debts and trespasses and sins against each other and if we're gonna do this do we need to like keep a scorecard and do we like put tuck that between the behind the hymnal uh, so that we can keep track every week where we stand that obviously is a little bit odd to think about, right? When we're talking about forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, it's, this is not a mechanical, algebraic understanding of what's happening. And I think that's part of why uh, Jesus tells this, this parable, this parable uh, uh, where Peter comes and asks, how are we to handle forgiveness? He wants to know, do I keep count, right? Do I keep count of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven? Oh, I've forgiven you seven times. That's how much forgiveness I need to offer you. And, and Jesus responds, this is not uh, like a seven keep track thing. This is 70 times seven or 77, depending upon the translation. And uh, 70 times seven, seven is the number of completion. Right? This is a lifestyle, a, a life of complete forgiveness that, that we need to practice day in and day out. And let me tell you the story about that, right? And he tells the story of this king who is settling up with his debtors and, and, and a, a servant, a slave comes in and owes him 10,000 talents. And 10,000 talents is like saying a bajillion, kazillion dollars. It's crazy money. Like that is, that's the number of like GDPs. To say that you owe the GDP of a nation, it is just huge, right? And, and so this slave owns a, a kajillion dollars and he is, 
told, if you don't come up with the money, you and all of your, your family will suffer. And he says, forgive me, let, like, forgive this debt, and he is forgiven. And then he goes out, and there's a guy who owes him a car, basically, a hundred denarii. It's like a small car loan. And how, how much would he have to borrow to, to buy like a 96 uh, Chevy truck? Like, that's what we're talking about. It's not insignificant, but it's not huge money, right? And so the guy, another guy owes him a hundred denarii. And, and he says, you know, you have to pay it back right now. You have to, and, and you have to, and, and, and he, he thre threatens the guy. And, and, and then uh, the, the king finds out and, and throws the, the, the slave into jail and, and he suffers. Like, and this is, the, the best summation I've heard of this parable is that what we see in the guy who has forgiven so much and then doesn't forgive a small car loan is that he burned the bridge that he stood on, right? That, that's what happens. It's not an algebraic. There is no way to compare what percentage of 100 denarii to ten, uh, the GDP of a nation, right? This is not, if, if you're doing that, that type of comparison, you completely misconstrue what's happening here. It's not about the math of it. It's about the relationship here. Because he had been forgiven, he was free to go live his life, and then he did not pass along that, that freedom to others. He did not forgive others, and so he burned the bridge that he stood on. There really cannot be a comparison between the sins that God forgives me of and the sins that I then to go to forgive others that are against me. Right? It's, it's, a, it's this very relational type of understanding. It's not something that I can plug into a calculator. If we refuse to follow Jesus in becoming like him, people that forgive, then we're not part of a people that are forgiving and forgiven. If we, if we want to change the imagery, if you will, maybe it isn't a bridge that burns, maybe it's a hose that is kinked. Like to, and I think about this, right? Forgiveness comes to us, and we need, we need to pray this prayer daily, we need to be forgiven daily, we need to be reassured and accepted daily. And so, we, if, if that forgiveness is like the water that we need, if we refuse then to pass that forgiveness on to others, if we hold a grudge, then what it is is putting a kink in the hose, and the water Water stops flowing. It's not that the, the source has stopped trying to send water, it's that we have stopped from being able to receive more of it. By putting a kink in the hose, by holding a grudge, by not passing along their forgiveness, we have made it so that we cannot accept that which we need. If forgiveness is letting go of debts, then refusing to let go is putting a kink in the hose. That's what, we, what I would call a grudge. And um, and just to think about, like, the way you have to hold a kink in a hose, or else if you let go, it'll come unkinked and the water will start to flow again. It's even the same verbiage, right? What do you do to a grudge? You hold a grudge. You can't just let go of a grudge, because if you let go of it, no, that doesn't work. You've got to hold on to a grudge. It takes a choice, a regular and committed choice. I'm going to hold on to this gr grudge. It's something we have to hold tight of. And what happens when we start to hold grudges? What happens to our families and our communities and our churches? The pressure builds up, right? That pressure builds up, and eventually it's going to get really messy. And so we pray. We forgive us as we forgive others. And that's, that's what we pray. To, may, may we please be able to let go of grudges. May we please be able to unkink the hose. May we please continue to be able to receive the water that we need so that we might then pass it along to others. To pray that we, we might forgive as, be forgiven as we forgive others is not to gloss over problems and pretend they don't exist. It is not to become a doormat and to cease to stand up for ourselves. It is not to make excuses hoping that it will be better next time and allow people to escape the consequences of their actions. It is not, none of that is part of forgiveness. Forgiveness is not hitting the other person back, right? Do we pray that we might forgive Forgive, that we might not hold grudges, that we might not try to get back at, at people, knowing that forgiveness is always going to be a challenge and we will only ever need to forgive when we are hurting. Like we need, forgiveness is easy to talk about when we're feeling good and feeling fine and everything's getting along because that's when we don't need to practice forgiveness. Forgiveness is the practice of letting go when we're still bleeding. Forgiveness is the practice of letting go when we're suffering. Forgiveness is the practice of letting go when the hurt is very real. 
This is what we see in Jesus, right? Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And that is their forgiveness. So you want to talk about how does Jesus forgive us? That is what he says to forgive us, all of us. And it happens on the cross. The forgiveness of, of, the, of Jesus happens while Jesus is suffering. Forgiveness is something that is offered when we're in the middle of pain. And so to say, forgive us, forgive us as we forgive those who, who have sinned against us it is a challenge, yet we dare to pray that we might forgive because otherwise the grudges that we hold on to will wreak, wreak havoc. They'll wreak havoc just like in the parable, the guy who owes the gazillion dollars. And if he is not forgiven, if he's going to hold on to this grudge, you notice it's not just him, but his whole, fam his whole family that's going to suffer consequences from this. And that's what happens as we hold grudges. We pray knowing that we need to forgive and knowing that it will not come naturally. We pray that we might forgive knowing that as we forgive then we continue with that image of that hose in the water that what we're doing when we unkink the hose and, and we accept that we are forgiven and we pass that forgiveness along that there's a connection there what we are doing is, is watering the community. We're watering the community so that our community might grow and flourish. We're watering our community, making it possible for us to come together and be honest, to be ourselves, to offer what and who we are and trust that we are going to be accepted for who we are. And then when we fall, fall step astray, we'll be able to forgive each other and work it out. When we misstep, when we sin against each other, we know that it is our practice of forgiveness, that it makes, makes it possible for us to deal with our sins, not get all kinked up and not have things blow apart. And in doing so, we do so growing to be ever more like the one who we worship, who we know as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, a community that we are created to reflect. The way that C.S. Lewis puts it is, to be Christian is to forgive the unexcusable, for God has forgiven the unexcusable in you. The way that I would try to put a, get my mind around this is that if we want to be part of a forgiving family, we start forgiving. That's how it works. If I can believe that others can be forgiven, then I can believe that I can be forgiven myself. And if I can't do that, then what I'm saying is, I'm not going to forgive people. Well, I'm not, then I don't belong in heaven. Because the kingdom of God, heaven, is the place based on forgiveness. Only possible because Jesus forgives. Right? If I'm not going to be part of the family that forgives, what I am choosing is to be part of hell. For hell is, in its very nature, the people who have held on to grudges and would rather hold on to a grudge than let go and be forgiven and accept something far more graceful and better to be part of the family of forgiveness that has Jesus as our, our Lord. I believe that this is what Reginald Denny understood. The man who back in 92 was, was hurt so badly in the, the riots in Los Angeles. I think he understood that he could hold on to a grudge against those who hurt him. Or he could let go of that grudge and forgive and have his life to live. That's exactly what he did. He moved on. He lived his life. He was not wrought up and bound to the past. He forgave and he lived well. I think that's true for us as well. We can pray this prayer, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we can choose to let go of our grudges. We can pray for the grace and the help to make, to make this possible. We can pray for those who annoy and offend and hurt us. And you want to talk about what practically can we do to make this happen? Pray for people. Take time to stop and pray for the people who we least want to pray. Pray that we can let go of the anger that we harbor and stop, stop waiting for the moment to try to get even. Let go of grudges, like unkink the hose, so that we can choose to tell the truth of how we have been hurt and then refuse to hurt someone in return. In doing so, we will know the forgiveness of God for our sins as well. If we want to be for part of a forgiving family, then we start by praying, let me forgive. And that's what will happen. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you now to pray with me. Lord, you know how hard forgiveness is as you forgave us. 
when you were hurting. And knowing this, we, we turn to you to ask that your spirit move in us that we might be able to forgive others. That we might be filled with a grace that overflows, a grace sufficient that, so that we can let go of what anger we have, what resentment we harbor, the grudges that we hold on to that have become comfortable. That we might let go of this and in doing so become part of the family of forgiveness and receive forgiveness ourselves. We pray for all of this year. This year is, has become a, a challenge and a journey. We pray for those who are figuring out these next steps in, in, in our, the journey of our communities. We pray for those who are determining how to handle this, this resurgence of COVID-19 in the various places around our, our nation. We pray for Macon, uh, where there has been a, a new, uh, new uh, group of people who have been diagnosed. We pray for our local health department, all, all the health departments, that they might have wisdom and patience that people might hear and understand and how much they care and how much the, the wisdom they, sh they are sharing. We pray for those who are struggling with this heat. We pray for those who must travel. We pray for the people making decisions about our schools, that uh, those decisions might be wise and, and that uh, the, the children and the teachers might be kept safe. We pray for all these things as we pray, uh, the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now may the peace of Christ be with you this day, and always go forth now in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.